All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a special presentation titled Witnessing the Destruction of Culture by ISIS. I'm your moderator, Mark Selensack, and I'm the executive director of the Sam and Francis Freed Holocaust and Genocide Academy. In his lecture, Pierre Secunda will describe how his abstract painting practice changed direction 20 years ago and became an examination of the destruction of culture. Tonight's program is organized in conjunction with the Nobody's Listening exhibition currently on display at the UNO Art Gallery. Nobody's Listening is a groundbreaking, award-winning, virtual reality experience, experience and immersive exhibition that commemorates the Yazidi genocide committed by ISIS in Northern Iraq. We are proud that the exhibition has made its premiere in the United States at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. The exhibition is on display until February 23rd, 2023, and is free and open to the public. Our lecture this evening is organized and hosted by UNO School of Arts and the Sam and Francis Freed Holocaust and Genocide Academy. We are grateful to our co-sponsors, which include the Holocaust, Genocide and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College, the Center for Genocide and Human Rights Research in Africa and the Diaspora at Northeastern Illinois University, and the Ray Walpole Institute for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity at Western Washington University. We thank these centers for their support. I would also like to recognize Amy Morris and David Helm from the School of Arts for organizing tonight's lecture. I also thank the Freed Academy's project and design manager, Angela Brown, as well as Courtney Corpetz and Randy Matley for promoting tonight's event. It is now my distinct honor to introduce tonight's special guest. Piers Secunda was born in London, England and studied at Chelsea Art College, graduating in 1998. His work has been exhibited internationally for many years and has received widespread acclaim by critics in Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and the United States. In 2018, his art was used as a tool of diplomacy between warring factions in Iraq. His work has been sold at Christie's and Sotheby's auction houses and has been displayed in the collections of at least a half dozen museums around the world, including the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the Iraq National Museum in Baghdad, as well as on permanent display at the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford University, one of the first art museums in the world, founded in 1683. Piers is currently working on several projects, including a collaborative drawing project with the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Now, before turning things over to our speaker tonight, please feel free to send questions directly uh, via Zoom using the Q&A button below. Once the lecture is finished, we can then open the floor to questions. And with that, I turn things over to Piers Secunda. Piers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm very grateful uh, that everybody who is listening has chosen to attend this talk this evening. And uh, thank you for taking the time and being with us. I was born in London in 1976, as Mark mentioned, and I grew up in between the United States and the UK. My mother was American, my father was English. I studied painting at Chelsea Art College in London and graduated in 1998. I think that uh, the most important thing for me to explain at the start of this talk uh, is that for 25 years, I've been making work about uh, the sculpture, the three-dimensional um, use of paint. I've been developing systems for working with paint in three dimensions. My intention in working this way is that I wanted to develop systems for painting uh, where I could expand in any direction without the traditional restraints of the canvas. For me, this limited too much, the canvas limited too much what the painting can be. The work which you're looking at is called Manifesto, and it was made between 2000 and 2003. It's a solid cube of white acrylic paint, and it measures 29 inches high. When I made this work, I was living in the Hudson Valley, 
hour and a half to the north of New York City. Because there's no tradition of painting in this manner, I had to develop the techniques that I needed as I was going along. And that meant that by default, I found myself working with the paint as though it were a sculptural material. This work from 2001, the year after I started the previous work, consists of 200 cast paint tubes. They're suspended inside a plexi box. The color is solid throughout each tube, and each tube is a different color, as you can see, and fades outwards in four directions. As you, if you look at the corners, you'll see that each of the objects in each corner is a different color altogether. It's a type of color field painting which grew out of the tradition of American abstract expressionism, but with a twist. So at this point in the development of my work, I'm slowly trying to move away from a modernist painting practice and to find my own language through an exploration of the craft of painting in an entirely new way. I've always known and felt strongly that the most significant thing that an artist can do is to make work about something that's happening while they're alive, either a statement or a document in some form. At this early stage of the development of my practice, I'm aware of this understanding, but I'm not seeking that in the dialogue of the work that I'm producing. As a creative, you often hear people say, you don't find your subject matter, your subject matter finds you. In March, 2001, the Taliban destroyed the sixth century Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan. I watched this on the television and it hit me like a brick to the side of the head. I simply couldn't understand why a pair of monumental sculptures carved into cliffs in Afghanistan suddenly had to be destroyed. It bothered me very greatly. In 2001, the internet was in its young stages, its formative stages, and it was very hard to find information that did anything more than scratch the surface in trying to explain what was going on. In retrospect, I think the lack of clear information and the conscious belief of the Taliban, which was told around the world, that somehow this action of destroying the Buddhas was going to improve the lives of people in Afghanistan, left me feeling stunned. I felt like it was too big and too dire a statement to really absorb at the time. I felt a need to try to understand this through my art, but I didn't know how this would manifest itself. Six months later on a Saturday afternoon, I was in New York City at a downtown camera shop called JNR Cameras trying to fix an issue with my digital camera. A few days later, a few blocks down the street from where I had been, this happened. We're all very familiar with September 11th, 2001 and what unfolded on that day. When I saw these pictures on the television from the Hudson Valley, I understood that there was a correlation. Immediately I understood there was a correlation between the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas and the targeting of the Twin Towers. So what I mean by this is that both were iconic and proud symbols, revered for very different qualities, but which certain extremist religious practices couldn't abide. As children, my brother and I had pressed our faces against the windows at New Jersey's Newark Airport and peered out into the night at the Twin Towers in the distance in Manhattan. Even as children, we understood how important these symbols were. After September the 11th, I realized that there were obviously forces at work which were far too powerful and persistent for me to ignore if they were intent on damaging cultural heritage and if those forces were, brilliant, were willing to bring that siege to the place where I lived and make it a part of my life. It was inevitable that I was going to find a way to make work about this. I was unable to let go of this sentiment and I became determined to integrate the noise of geopolitics somehow into my studio practice. In 2003, I moved back to London and started making work with the, an industrial floor paint, which cures up to any thickness overnight. This allowed me to make very quickly, to make works like this one from 2005. What you're looking at is a solid paint construction an assemblage with two large slabs of paint at the top, cast metal reinforcing bar on the left made out of paint 
and sheets of paint at the front with ink transferred from photocopies onto the surface. This is a, a work from a small group of wall-mounted works, which were the first in which I'm trying to bring some of the noise of the outside world into my studio practice. On the 7th of July, 2005, four suicide bombs were detonated on public transport in London during the rush hour. Three went off in trains and one in a red London double-decker bus. This work, which you're looking at, is a direct reaction to the photographs that were published in the media about the bus bombing. The sides of the bus were splayed open, the roof was gone, the handrails inside of the bus were twisted around and left sticking up into the sky above the exposed top deck. 13 people died as a result of the bus bombing. Overall, 52 people died on the day and 700 were injured. Terrorism has been in one form or another, a periodic feature of life in London for a very long time, be it IRA bombing campaigns, in the 70s, 80s, or religious extremists more recently. One way or another, I've always been conscious of terrorism for as long as I can remember. In 2009, I went to an artist residency in Shanghai, in China. From the building where the residency was run, out of the window, I could see the inhabitants of a 19th century Hutong community being forcibly evicted from their homes. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo of that scene, and now, of course, I wish I did. But it, it's very difficult to take a photo of someone suffering. And um, if you try to picture in your mind's eye traditional uh, Chinese houses with peaked corners on the roofs, courtyards, sometimes with a tree inside, traditional communities, surrounded by high-rise buildings. Those houses were being torn down and pulled apart to make way for something else, probably a glass and steel high-rise building. Seeing this made making art in my studio at that residency very difficult. It was such an alarming visual and it had filled my eyes and my head to such a degree. But the, the experience of, of witnessing this pulled my focus back to the subject of the deliberate destruction of culture. So whilst I was in Shanghai, I tried to think of a way to attempt to apply or capture the texture of violent geopolitics in the surface of my industrial floor paint. I trawled around Shanghai and found some of the Chinese equivalent of my paint and started making work. And before I left China, with the help of a couple of friends, one of whom spoke fluent Chinese, we persuaded soldiers on the PLA, People's Liberation Army, firing range about an hour to the south of Shanghai to shoot some sheets of industrial floor paint for me, which I could then integrate into assemblages. The idea was that the shattered hole would capture the instant in which violence made contact with the art. I was unsure whether the paint sheets would break into pieces, but luckily they didn't. And the results for me were quite shocking. You're looking at a close up of one of those holes. After a short while spent in the studio trying to integrate these shot panels of paint into assemblage sculptures, I realized that the shattered holes held the space around them to such a degree that if they became part of something else, an assemblage, they would be compromised. So I started to look at them as works of art in their own right. This work is simply titled PLA Bullet Hole Painting. These shot works were sufficiently interesting to me that I started trying to think of ways to take the work further, wanting to find a more direct merger between the paint and the texture of damage, and at the same time, the loss of culture. My mind kept reverting to the Bamiyan Buddhas, that very graphic image of those extraordinary sculptures in the cliff sides in Afghanistan being reduced to a cloud of dust. So I started contacting people in Afghanistan who I thought might be able to help me go there with the intention of making work about the Taliban. 
it was really a complete potluck experience. I was sending out lots of emails and nobody ever replied. I mean, it's a pretty difficult thing to answer. An email that says, hello, I'm a living artist. I'm in London. I want to come to Afghanistan. Find a way to document what's happening. Can you help me? So obviously nobody responded. Then all of a sudden, this fellow, Sadar Ahmed Khan, who was running a press agency in Afghanistan called Kabul Pressistan, emailed me. I responded and I explained to him what I wanted to do. And I sent the email feeling very confident that I wouldn't hear anything back. But he responded almost immediately and he said, I can definitely help you. As well as working with the international media, Sardar had a direct link to the Taliban. So Sardar actually asked the Taliban to shoot some of my art. We spoke at considerable length about how he would do this, how he would conduct the conversation. And he said that it was unlikely that they would want to do it for free, which then generated a conversation about the complications of an exchange of payment for the Taliban to shoot things for me. Of course, you can't hand over money to the Taliban because you're sponsoring terrorism. He warned me that if they said no when he proposed this idea, or if they were confused by the request, that he wouldn't be able to take the conversation any further because he was a press liaison to the Taliban. And the confusion is what happened when he started the conversation, so he shut the conversation down. So instead, we came up with a plan B. He plotted out on a map of Kabul all of the places that the Taliban had carried out attacks over the previous two years. And then he drove to each location to get the back background story about what had happened on each, in each place from local people. And then he called me and he said that he found one site where definite Taliban bullet holes were clearly identified and that I could make molds of them. So with Sardar's help and having arranged a place to stay with some journalists in Kabul, I flew to Afghanistan and I made molds of Taliban bullet damage from two different sites with the help of a local police chief who volunteered to keep us safe while this was going on. And safety was needed. The first night I was in Kabul, there was a rocket attack on the city. And believe me, you don't want to hear an air raid siren 50 meters down the road at two o'clock in the morning. So we were very grateful for this policeman and his security. The first site that we visited in the morning was the location of a suicide bomb attack, where the bombing was preceded by a gunfight. The Taliban shot two drivers who were in a car employed by a private security firm. Their car was parked outside the business premises. The Taliban were attacking the building with the intention of getting inside and, and bombing it. As the shooting happened and the two men in the car were killed by the Taliban, the wall behind the car in which they were sitting was damaged and I was able to mold those bullet holes. The second site that we visited that day, which is shown in this photograph, was the location of an attack on an apartment building, which was the home of Indian doctors who were staffing the Kabul hospital on a voluntary basis. They had flown and traveled to Afghanistan at their own expense. And they had all been killed in the small hours of the morning by the Taliban, who dynamited the gates at the front of this complex and gone in. Hus husbands, wives, children, everybody who was inside died. It was a raid which had developed into an especially horrific siege of these apartments that you can see behind me in this photograph. I still haven't used the molds from the second site because the experience of being there, going into these apartments was so awful that I simply don't want to revisit it. So back in London in 2011, this is an exhibition of Taliban bullet hole paintings the work that I was showing here, were they were about as far as I was able to push both the paint materially and my capacity to procure subject matter. These works became an action for me in bringing the texture of violence into the gallery. Without the viewer having to see the imagery through the portal of the media. 
So instead of people looking at these works on the television screen, they're seeing a forensic quality reproduction in the flesh, and they're directly engaged by a physical encounter on a granular level. The reproduction of the bullet holes, as I said, is to a forensic level. It's altogether a very different experience from seeing pictures. Fiden Art Book Publishers, one of the biggest book publishers in the world, reviewed this exhibition, and, and many people did, but the Fiden review was especially interesting for me. And a brief quote, they said that they felt that this work it is the most direct, was, past tense, most directly inspired work we have seen on the subject of Afghanistan. These works and others which followed were shown internationally for around about five, six years in countries from Australia to the United States and in South, in South America. The development of the paint craft of my studio practice using my industrial floor paint enabled me to make these works. The damaged panels, which you're seeing here, this is a work from 2014, a couple of years later. The damaged panels and the blocks above them, which are holding the works onto the wall, are made out of industrial floor paint. That includes the nuts and bolts, which pass through the top of the panels and into the blocks, which are secured to the wall. Tragically, in the spring of 2014, around the time that I made this work, Sada Ahmed Khan, the fellow who I showed you a photo of and who helped me by facilitating uh, the molding of bullet damage and my passage to Afghanistan and safety while I was there, his wife and his two daughters died in a Taliban shooting at the Serena Hotel, which is in central Kabul, whilst they were sitting down to have a meal in the restaurant in the hotel. His toddler son was shot in the head and left with brain damage, but he survived. And now he lives in Canada. Sado was an amazing supporter. Every time I opened an exhibition of Taliban works, he would email me and text me and say, brilliant, well done, keep going. No one's coming here. Keep taking it to the world. Please don't stop. So I didn't. People thought that the Taliban were really the worst form of extremists we could imagine until ISIS came along in 2014. They proudly made it their mission to destroy ancient sites, museums, monuments, tombs, mosques, churches, and libraries, and they legalized looting on a vast scale. The Middle East had never seen such systematic, deliberate destruction of culture on an industrial scale across countries, Iraq and Syria, simultaneously using military equipment. It was completely unprecedented. And as we know, and the world knew about it immediately because of their use of social media, I knew that this was the biggest cultural cleansing since the Second World War. And since the destruction of culture was the focus of my work at the stage, and the further my work developed, deeper I dug into the subject, the clearer it was, the more I looked at the news, that I was gonna to have to examine what these people were doing. Showing the scale of the looting which ISIS encouraged, which a lot of people don't realize, these are two photographs of Dura Europos, an important ancient Hellen, Parthian and Roman city in modern day Syria. It sits against the bank of the Euphrates River. You can see in the top right-hand corner of the photos. Remember, the cradle of civilization was in between Tigris and Euphrates, where the wheel, the plow, the fermentation process were all created for the first time. On the left is a photograph which shows the ancient city before Isis and on the right after Isis. You can see thousands of tiny pinholes which are dug into the ground by looters who are trying to find anything that they can sell. There is a possibility that a little bit of the looting was carried out outside the umbrella of ISIS 
But since ISIS were providing permission and sanctioning looting by handing out permission slips, and they controlled this area, we know it's their doing. The number of holes dug by looters, which you can see on the right hand photograph, are so extensive that the city grid of roads has become visible, as the roads were the only part that remained unexcavated by the looters. It's possible to know how much ISIS benefited financially from this, but they did use it as a source of income. They had many, and looting was one. So in 2015, I started to seek ways to get into the recently liberated ancient sites in Iraq, the places which had been taken back from ISIS. And I was astonished at how quickly this happened. It took about two weeks to find somebody who could help me. And I flew to Suleimania in the Kurdish region of Iraq, in the northeast of Iraq, in the autumn of 2015. With the help of the PUK, the People's Union of Kurdistan, a regional political party, and the Peshmerga, the Kurdish military, I was on the front line as it was in September 2015 to the southwest of the city of Kirkuk a few hours after arriving in Iraq from England. This is part of a village on your screen at the moment. This is part of a village called Abu Hamid. As we were approaching this village in armored land cruisers, I was told by the Peshmerga that it was recently liberated. As we got close, I was told that in fact it was very recently liberated. And when we arrived, there was still some fire burning in the village. This building is part of a boys and girls school which became a regional ISIS headquarters that made the target for the Peshmoga to take it back. The Peshmoga had described an action which had taken place. Pointing to this building, I was told that it had been in the middle of a firefight and that ISIS fighters had been shooting in one direction. The Peshmerga had been shooting back and this building was in the middle. So if I molded bullet damage from the face of the building that you see here, that that would be ISIS damage for certain. So I set about making some molds. And while I was molding the bullet damage on this building, I asked the Peshmerga where ISIS were currently. And I was told that the flapping sound that I could hear in the distance was a tarpaulin draped over an ISIS position, which was a couple of hundred yards away. It was visible. There was a direct line of sight to it. This photo, this photo shows the ground around the school of the building, around the, uh, with, facing with my back to the building you were just looking at. I was around, I was making around about 20 molds and I'd been instru instructed to only to walk on a narrow concrete strip down the side of the building. And when I asked why one of the stepped forward, picked up the mortar, which you can see at the bottom of the photo and wagged it at me as though he was telling me off before placing it down on the ground again, a couple of feet from where I was standing. After I finished making the molds, in that previous village of Abu Hamad, we went on to a second village, which was an ancient village, also up against the front line called Tel Arabah. A tel is a low archeological mound. And the village sat on top of that mound. The mud brick building, which you can see here, was directly behind me as I was molding more bullet damage. This photo was taken by the PUK, representative who was with me and who had been translating some of the things that Peshmerga had wanted me to understand about safety procedures, etc. And he was a film student when he was in his teens. He trained at Saddam Hussein's film school in Baghdad. Very unusual for a Kurd to have spent time like that in Baghdad in those days. But he wanted to have a go with my camera, so I gave it to him. He took a lot of, a lot of really good photos. This is one Unfortunately, in this photo, you can't see inside that room on the right hand side, which I could see inside. And as I was mixing up my dental putty, which I used to make the molds, I was standing looking into that room and I could see rugs on the floor, furniture all around, all of the things that you and I would have at home 
and it was just as though the inhabitants had left a couple of minutes ago. But notice that the rest of the building has been completely obliterated. The roof has collapsed. Part of the building is gone altogether. It was a very disturbing sight. While I was making the, these molds with my back to the damaged house, a mortar came down in the village of Tel Arabah. And the Peshmerga very calmly told me, when you're ready, we should leave. So I looked at the bag, which had my molds in it, and I said, we've got plenty of molds, let's leave right away. So we did. And as we drove out of Tel Aviv, we slowed down in the armored land cruiser, which we were in, and looked at this crater, which was steaming a little bit on the side of the road. Unfortunately, the photograph didn't capture that, the steam. Um, and the Peshmerga said, yeah, that's where it landed. The crater had not been there when we arrived to the village. So you go from at 10 minutes down the road to the city of Kirkuk, where we all decided that we were going to go and have some lunch, and we went to a kebab shop. It amazes me to see how life carries on on so many levels when the chaos of war is happening so close by. This is one of the very odd realities of war zones. I'd taken my camera back from the PUK fellow and obviously realizing that this is not the average day in the studio, I thought I better photograph everything. So I snapped this photo as I was starting to go up a flight of stairs inside the restaurant. This is the table where we sat and had lunch. I found out about 10 days later that this street had been car bombed. Now, I don't know if the restaurant survived or if the people inside it were hurt. The PUK guy couldn't tell me, um, but they made an amazing lamb kebab. And I remember the place very well. I wanted to add in this photograph to show you a snapshot of the remarkable beauty of the Kurdish region of Iraq, which is the northeast of Iraq. Again, the most awful things happen even in the most magical settings, such as this landscape. So as you can see, it's sort of looks like a backdrop to, the, to a Lord of the Rings movie. It was just magical, but it was just so close to this war. This is one of the first works that I made using the ISIS bullet molds from the frontline villages in Iraq. Occasionally, these works get sold. And when they do, I make a financial contribution to an orphan charity, which operates in the Kurdish region where I took the molds from the villages of Abu Hamid and Tel Arabah. The orphan charity gives money, uh, receives money rather, uh, to give children an education, put a roof over their heads, feed them three meals a day, and in time as they get older, give them vocational training. So this work is a recreation of a miniature section of the Temple of Zeus relief from the ancient Roman city of Pergamon, which is in the modern country of Turkey. To make this work and the ones which follow I purchased commercially available plaster casts of reliefs from the civilizations whose, remaining, whose remains were being destroyed by ISIS. So Assyrian heritage, Roman heritage in Syria and Iraq, Egyptian heritage, etc. And I merge through a sculptural process, the ISIS bullet molds with the plaster casts to make multi-panel works, which were then cast in my industrial floor paint in my studio. So although this looks like a plaster cast, it's my paint. I usually buy it, so it's a painting, not in a non-traditional sense, of course. I usually buy my paint white because I can buy small quantities, whereas if I need to buy a color, there's a minimum quantity and it's very, very large. But I also am aware that adding color to these works would detract from the clarity of the message. So I prefer to keep them monochrome. So photographs of the same works in a small exhibition, they were shown in these very beautiful ornate Victorian cabinets at New York University's Institute of Fine Arts in 2016. 
one of the rewarding elements of making these works and meeting and getting to know is meeting and getting to know archaeologists, historians, restorers, a lot of whom work in the regions that I visit, and who are specialists in the territory and the history of places that I'm making work about. In 2017, I exhibited a number of ISIS paintings at Thomas Yackel Gallery in the Chelsea neighborhood of New York. As part of this exhibition, I was introduced to Jason Ur, a celebrated archeologist who works at Harvard University, and he kindly agreed to write an introductory wall text for me, which contextualizes the ancient reliefs that I've been working with. The text helps to explain the purpose of the imagery and at the same moment demonstrates the continuum of the human experience. So this three panel work, which shows increasing damage to the right, is a reproduction of an ancient Roman relief, which was from a Syrian city called Palmyra, which ISIS did terrible damage to. So Jason Ur's wall text reads as follows. Walls have always been canvases for people's beliefs and ambitions. In the ancient world, palaces, temples, and tombs were adorned with images of how the world was meant to be. That reality might have been cosmic, with rituals performed properly in the present or the hereafter, or shown by courtiers or supplicants approaching the king. Styles and specific messages may seem alien to the viewer, but the underlying sentiments are timeless, and they therefore reinforce our connection to the past. An assault on the monuments of the past is an attack on the identities of the people who descended from them. But it's more than that. These bullock pop marked scenes from Egyptian, Syrian, and classical antiquity remind us that it's an assault on our shared humanity. Jason Ur, Professor of Archaeology, Department of Anthropology, Harvard University. In the autumn of 2017, I was given an invitation to attend the UNESCO General Meeting in Paris for discussions about the destruction of heritage by religious extremists. When the room filled up, I realized that I was seated about five feet away from Secretary General Irina Bakova, who is sitting here on the left, and Iraqi Culture Minister Friad Rwandazi, who is to her right. During an intermission in the discussions, I introduced myself to the minister and I gave him a postcard of one of my ISIS paintings, a bullet hole painting. He looked at it for a few moments without speaking and then he asked me, when are you coming to Baghdad? I improvised and I told him March and he gave me his personal phone number. So five months later, in the spring of 2018, I was in the culture minister's office in Baghdad. He and the head of the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage gave me a letter providing me with permission to make molds of the ISIS smashed sculptures inside the Mosul Museum. This was really a key moment for me because I knew that if I were able to make those molds directly from ancient sculptures inside the Mosul Museum, which ISIS had desecrated terribly, I would have made the merger that I had wanted from the start, producing work which lifted the texture, of, the texture off the surface of damaged heritage. So I went north from Baghdad up to the uh, northeast of Iraq to the Kurdish region, and then drove westwards across the plains, which you can see here, to Mosul. Now, if you know your recent history, you will have known, or you'll know that the siege of Mosul happened in 2017, and the devastation of the city was very extensive. So tragically, when I arrived to Mosul, it looked like this. The old part of the city was completely destroyed. A lot of the roads were totally obscured by collapsed buildings, and, and vast areas were reduced to rubble. You couldn't tell one house from the next. A lot, of the building, a lot of the city remains this way. On this particular journey, 
this was still a relatively dangerous place. There were car bombs going off and kidnappings occurring, type of retribution which happens after a war. So on this journey, the Iraqi army took care of me and brought me into the city of Mosul and moved me around the city, including at one stage, bizarrely going the wrong way down a freeway. And they took me into and to Mosul, the museum, where I was able to make molds from the, the damaged surfaces of Assyrian sculptures, which had been smashed by ISIS when they arrived to the city a few years previously. In early 2018, when I was inside the Mosul Museum, there hadn't yet been a full assessment of the damage to the artifacts which remained inside the building and whether or not they could be fully repaired. I used a process for molding which I developed over several years with an ex Tate Gallery conservator. We developed this process specifically so that I could take molds of World War II damage from the exterior walls of the Pergamon Museum in Berlin and blitz damage from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. So this process, which I then used inside the Mosul Museum, involves painting liquid latex onto the broken stone. And that's what I'm doing in this photograph. The latex dries in about 10 minutes. And on top of the latex, I apply a dental putty. The same thing that dentists uh, use to mold your teeth when you're in the dental chair. The putty cures in about 15 minutes. And when the dental putty is removed, it lifts a forensic quality reproduction of the stone. The latex dries to an incredibly thin layer, and that then peels away, usually in one piece, and it comes off the stone completely. It leaves no residue at all, and it leaves the stone surface very clean. Mosul is the, la the second largest city in Iraq. And as you saw from that earlier photograph of the city from above, it, it's in a dire state. But at the same time, and I've seen it on many occasions, I've seen amazing displays of the strength of the human spirit under these extraordinary circumstances. The building in the background of this photo is like all of the buildings on this particular street. As we were driving down the road, or the vehicles in which we were moving stopped for a few moments in traffic. And I saw this young fellow walk out of a partially collapsed building. And I realized that the gap underneath the bottom floor of the building, which he had walked through, was a bakery and it was still functioning. It looks no more organized than the ruin that's going on in the background in this scene here. It was quite an extraordinary thing. He had a real strut to his stride. Quite rightly, too, he'd survived the occupation of the city by ISIS and they had turned it into their capital. It was an uplifting moment to see this guy walking down the street with these breads and the way he walked. And it really made me think about the endurance of the human spirit. And it made me feel hopeful about the future of the city of Mosul. Now, quite a few times in this talk, I've mentioned Kurds. You may have heard about the Kurds. The Kurds are the largest ethnicity in the world who don't have their own nation. Their territory crosses several countries' borders, Turkey in the north, Iran in the east, Iraq in the south, and Syria in the west. So their traditional territory is divided up by these countries. In 2018, after a major portion of fighting of the major portion of fighting was uh, ended against ISIS, the siege and liberation of Mosul was done. The Iraqi Kurds held a referendum on independence from Iraq. The history here is complicated, so I'll simplify it as much as possible. 182,000 Kurds were killed by Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party. So the Iraqi Kurds have really struggled with being locked into the modern territory of Iraq. And it was their military who, as Hillary Clinton correctly pointed out at the time, did more to push ISIS around and get them under control with their army, the Peshmerga, than anybody else had. 
including the Iraqi army, many claim. The Kurds in Iraq voted in their referendum over 98% in favor of independence from Iraq. And that created a violent reaction. And the Iraqi army took back the city of Kirkuk, which is ethnically Kurdish, and the Kirkuk and the, and the Kirkuk oil fields from the Kurds. And this was an outright moment of war between the Baghdad government and people in the north of their own country. It could have spiraled completely out of control and turned into a civil war. But by handing, by retreating out of Kirkuk and handing the city to the Iraqi army, they created, they, they saved the city, they stopped it being turned into a ruin like Mosul, and they then created a de demilitarized zone to the north and east of the city of Kirkuk in order to protect the rest of the ethnic Kurdish northeast of Iraq. And when this boundary was then tested by the Iraqi army, the Peshmerga hit back very hard and stopped the Iraqi army in their tracks. The reason I'm telling you this is because in the autumn of 2018, a very, very short time after the cessation of violence between the Baghdad government and the Kurdish authorities, I was asked by the Kurdish high representative to the UK, who is basically an ambassador, but without a nation, and he's at the bottom on the left-hand side in this photograph, to be an intermediary and to ask the Iraqi ambassador, who is in the bottom right-hand corner, who he had just met for the first time, to hold a collaborative exhibition, a collaborative project between the Baghdad Iraqis on the right and the Kurds on the left. And that collaborative project would come in the form of an exhibition of my own art about ISIS. It was a mutually agreeable subject to them both. And the project happened in the Iraqi ambassador's private residence, which is where we're standing in this photograph. Here they both are. The Iraqi ambassador on the right, Kurdish high representative on the left, me in the middle. After the exhibition opening event, I saw subsequently, I saw both the high representative and the ambassador a few times socially. And they were always enthusiastic to encounter each other and they talked at length. And on the last occasion that I saw them, I arrived to a talk at the British Museum and both of them were sitting in the front row at the, in the auditorium, talking intensively and for a long time. And their respective employees were stopping people from coming close to them and interrupting their conversations. It's a great honor and a remarkable thing for me to know that I played a small role in bridge building between them. And it's certainly something I could never have imagined when I left art college back in 1998. In 2019, I was commissioned by the Ashmolean Museum to make a, a large installation for an exhibition which was curated by the head of Middle East collections for Paul Collins, who is now the keeper of Middle East art at the British Museum. The Ashmolean Museum is part of Oxford University. It's their museum of art and archeology, span and it's one of the oldest museums in the world. In fact, they invented the word museum to describe what they had built when it was finished in 1683. The exhibition examined the nation state of Iraq and how it came into existence which to cut a long story short was defined by British and French politicians and bureaucrats in 1918 and 1919 with red crayons, drawing lines on maps to make borders, making sure that both parties got what they wanted out of the territory since the Ottoman Empire had been disbanded at the end of the First World War. It was a classic piece of regional meddling by colonial powers with far too little care for locals and the tri a traditional and tribal boundaries, migratory movements, and their trade concerns. This red line agreement, as it became known, is how the Kurds ended up being partially locked into eastern Iraq, northeastern Iraq without a nation of their own. In creating this exhibition, Paul Collins wanted to draw a line across time from those ill-conceived colonial red line choices to the present day and to show 
how the unfortunate red line decisions had generated underlying stresses and strains amongst the tribal communities and religions in the area, and which ultimately brought about the conditions from which ISIS rose to power. The exhibition was titled Owning the Past from Mesopotamia to Iraq. I proposed this installation, which you can see on the screen, to Paul and the museum director, and they told me to go ahead and make it. It took nine months to produce this. So what you're seeing here is approximately a 2000 piece installation. All of the parts are made of industrial floor paint. So to make these objects, we laser scanned and 3D printed the Ashmolean Museum's own Assyrian relief, which you saw in the previous photo, and used a casting process to merge the 3D print with the smashed stone texture that I molded in the Mosul Museum. That's how I produced all these rocks. These are actually paintings. Every one of them is made out of industrial floor paint, right down to the tiny crumbs, which are no, no bigger than a fingernail. Every one of them has the Mosul Museum smashed sculpture texture on its surface. My personal aim with this work was to try and express to the viewer, whoever came into the museum and saw this, what it felt like to me as an artist to walk into the desecrated Mosul Museum the previous year. When ISIS people smashed up the artifacts in the Mosul Museum, the largest of the Assyrian carving, carvings, which were there, were worked on with pneumatic drills, the type of drills that people use to dig up streets. They cleaved the sculptures to pieces, they chucked them away and dumped them in the Mosul River. When the meltwater came down the Mosul River from the mountains in the spring, swept all the pieces away, they became archeology span again. This same installation that you're looking at in a slightly smaller volume is now in the UNO Gallery at University of Nebraska, Omaha, as part of the exhibition which Mark introduced called Nobody's Listening. The exhibition advocates for the rights of the Yazidi people and Christians, Assyrians, and a large number of other minorities and religious groups who are from the north of Iraq and whose identities and families and friends were so horrifically hurt by ISIS and their war. It's important to understand what ISIS was doing to wipe out people's history and cultural heritage. It is an act of genocide. They were trying to delete history so that they could have a blank canvas on which to create their own version of the future. By wiping out the past and all traces of it, literally pulling it from the earth, looting, to make sure that they got it all, and selling the artifacts out of the region or smashing them to pieces, ISIS were carrying out a very extreme type of cultural cleansing. Years later, people in the region are still struggling to rebuild and to save what's left. Imagine if your homes, local churches, the school that you went to, your families had all been swept away in a tide of war, where part of the aim was to kill all the men and enslave all the women. How do you return home after that? Where do you even start? These are the questions that we aim to focus people's minds on with the exhibition of this thing. And so we would like to encourage you to go and see it. In essence, it's an advocacy exhibition which requests a legal response to what ISIS did, in particular to the Yazidi people. In 2020, whilst the Ashmolean Museum redesigned their Middle East room, the curator, Paul Collins, came to me and said that he found the installation that I've made very compelling and he wanted to commission me to make a work which is now on permanent display in the Middle East room at the Ashmolean Museum. And this is the work. The lines across the right-hand panel are made with pneumatic drills by ISIS, again, molded in the Mosul Museum. The left-hand panel, the intact panel, 
is from the 3D print, laser scan and 3D print, which we made in the Mosul Museum in order to produce the installation, which is now in Nebraska. For me personally, I hope that these works stand as a warning from history and ultimately caution people that no matter how safe we feel, that we can't become complacent and that political climates can change very fast. And although it's very hard for us to imagine, things can get out of control very quickly. And it can happen here, as it did in the Middle East, as it did in Europe in the 1930s, where museums were destroyed and lost throughout the Second World War. People's lives were turned upside down. So on that note, I'd like to thank you all very much for listening. I'm very grateful that you chose to attend with us. And I would like to hand back to Mark now. And um, I think that uh, we will be taking some questions if you have any, I'll try to answer them. Thank you so much, Piers. Uh, that was an extraordinary uh, presentation. So as I said, uh, if you do have questions uh, for our speaker, for Piers, uh, you can use the Q&A button below uh, and we'll get them directly. Uh, while people are thinking of their question, uh, Piers, I'll actually begin. I actually have a few questions for you myself. So with respect to that di diplomacy project, if we can call it that, between the government in Baghdad and the Kurds, uh, can you actually give an example of how you played a, a diplomatic role uh, in that uh, conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for example, at the exhibition opening, uh, where you saw a photograph of myself on one side was uh, Kawan Tahir, the high representative of Kurdish people, and on the other side, the ambassador. Um, when, when we arrived at that, um, at that exhibition opening, um, we were coming to a house which had been purchased by Saddam Hussein for the Iraqi representation to the UK, the, the embassy. Um, and uh, the Kurds didn't really want to come into the building. They were very anxious about it. Uh, they had been at war with these people a very short time before. They felt bullied, very bullied by them. And uh, one of the um, employees of the ambassador came to me and said, um, I don't want speeches. Okay, I understand you've got a speech. We don't want speeches. So I thought, well, then how do we explain why we're here in this room together? So I went to the ambassador and I said, look, I've, I've got a speech. And I showed him in my top pocket. And he said, I have a speech too, but I've been told no speeches. I said, look, look, you're the ambassador. You outrank everybody in this room. If you want speeches, we should, we should do them. And he said, great, yes, let's definitely do this. Does Mr. Tahir have a speech? Yes, he does. Um, he said, okay, you go first, I'll go second, and Mr. Tahir goes third. So I said, no, no, I think this is wrong. You represent the Iraqi nation, many millions of people. I'm one person, I'm an artist. You should speak first. Karwan Tahir should speak second. He represents the Kurdish people in Iraq, and I'll speak third. And so he laughed and he said, yeah, okay, I, I see where you're coming from. Let, let's do it. So I went back to Mr. Tahir, who had also been told no speeches, and I said, there are going to be speeches. This is how it's going to work. Um, so they, we gave the speeches followed on from each other. Uh, all the way through the process, there were people trying to sh shut this project down, and I had to liaise between them to keep it going and make it happen. Thank you. Uh, another question we have is, is um, uh, just to paraphrase, this is an extraordinarily complex and difficult way to create art. I'm like, I'm, I don't think I'm telling you something you don't already know. It requires a great deal of, of time, collaboration, travel, and of course, personal risk. Yeah. Uh, can you maybe reflect a bit more um, on that challenge uh, to create this type of art? Sure. I mean, I, where to start? I, mean, I, I really feel that this, this um, destruction of culture subject is something that affected me very deeply when the Taliban destroyed the Bamiyan Buddhas. Um, and the further I've got involved in it, the more important I felt that, it's, uh, that, that, that I should be seeing these places, experiencing it, understanding from local people what they heard, what they saw what they lost, what they felt. Um, you're hearing rain on the building, which I'm in, I'm afraid. Um, and they really wanted to explain something to me because somebody had arrived who wanted to hear their story. And it compelled me more and more 
to try to explain what had happened in these places. And the more I did it, the more engaged I became in attempting to help in some way by contributing some money back to them if works got sold, for example, and knowing that I was doing something very, very small uh, to help and assist. Uh, but at the same time, um, the importance of understanding that the destruction of culture is not just about smashing up art. Um, there is, of course, there's risk involved. There's no question. It's not just about smashing up art. It's, it's about the fact that people who are doing this want to change the way that your brain thinks and functions. They don't want you to be who you are. They want you to be something else, something that aligns with a very so often scary uh, um, autoc autocracy, a serious uh, shift in the nature of um, entire peoples. And if you don't comply, they'll kill you. That's a story which must be distributed and it can only be distributed in multiple ways. It can't only come to you through the media because it's too easy to change the channel. If these works of art or works of art like them end up in museums, and that's starting to happen now. The warning from history is there on a more permanent basis. Thank you. We've got several questions now coming in from our, our audience. Um, uh, I'm not going to read them all because they're, they're quite detailed, but uh, they're very complimentary about your art and your, your courage to create your work, uh, your work of art. Uh, the first question I have here is, as for the eradication uh, or destruction of culture, uh, which is, of course, horrible. Do you feel that that most colonizers have attempted to do the same whenever they enter uh, into an occupying area? Yes. Or is this is this yeah. exclusive to ISIS? This is. No, I think that that's absolutely right. I don't know an exception. It's just the extent to which they're willing to go to do it. Some are absolutely uh, in, um, hell bent on totally reforming the way of life of the people they're encountering, and will kill them if they those people don't comply. Um, or they'll say, look, you know, continue living the way you're going, but we've got a church over here now, and we expect you to be there every Sunday. You know, mm. there are various grades of, of this type of enforcement of a new uh, way of life. Um, but yes, as far as I understand, every colonializing culture uh, does this. Yeah. Uh, we have a, I know we have a lot of art students, art history students in the audience, and this is a really interesting yep. question because it comes from a different point of view. Um, do you have any idea what someone who isn't an artist can do to help? Uh, it brings to mind the saying, someone ought to do something, but we are all someone. What can we do if we're not artists uh, about the destruction of culture, the preservation of culture? Well, um, there are many things that you can do. Ultimately, uh, it's a matter of awareness and alert alertedness. Um, completely outside of this, I started a conversation with the museum in Iraq about whether or not they have an evacuation plan for their most valued objects, and they don't. Um, I, I can help them by advising them to have museum quality crates made, how to produce them, where to put them, so that they can put in plan the beginnings of some sort of process. Um, what can an individual do? You can support organizations which uh, uh, restore world heritage. Um, there are many of them. Um, you can, they, and they're always seeking money. Um, there are organizations which will uh, say, for example, go to Mosul, help them to restore the ancient mosques which were there. Uh, you can find these on the internet by Googling restoration of Mosul, starting point. Uh, you'll find very serious, legitimate organizations who are supported by the likes of uh, UNESCO. Um, if you want to go down to a, a, a personal level, you know, UNICEF, for example, uh, the United Nations support lots of these organizations, and they are very, very enthusiastic to take funding. Because believe me, it takes a hell of a lot of money, excuse the language, to rebuild the city, especially an ancient city. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we do have several more questions. I know we're, we're running out of time. Ask as many Absolutely. as you want. Okay, so uh, you, you did touch on ethics uh, in your in your work uh, with the different groups that you've had to work with. Uh, this one is more uh, on the personal end of your own artistic ambitions. So the question is, how do you reconcile personal artistic ambitions with work like you've covered here? 
what if, for example, your artistic desires don't necessarily overlap with feeling obligated to help people like the Yazidis? Um, that, that's the question for the audience. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, you know, a, a lot of artists who I know are very happy um, making work as I was, uh, abstract work, uh, work which looks compelling because of an interaction of colors um, and work which is commercially viable, uh, which can build a market for your output, uh, your studio practice, um, and absolutely a thousand percent fine, brilliant. So many of the artists I know and love, whose work I love, are in that sphere. Um, very few artists who I know do uh, or produce, <coughs> excuse me, um, produce uh, work which advocates for a cause. I tell you now as an artist that if you choose to go in that direction, you're not going to have a commercially viable experience of it unless you can make work which speaks about these subjects, but which is visually appealing. So this is a very fine balance and it's a hard balance to strike. Um, the way I reconcile myself with it is that when the work is sold, if it gets sold, I give a contribution to a Kurdish orphan charity in the region where I made those molds. So giving something back, as I said, is really important for me. Um, but equally, you know, I'm not a charity, so I don't make work in order to gift it away. Um, I make work in the hope that it finds a home with people who want it, ideally institutions, and they pay me for it, and I continue. It's, you know, I, it, it subsists the studio practice, and I continue. Uh, another uh, question we have for you is more about your 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 work as a whole. Uh, yeah. Have you worked on any projects uh, in the realm of human suffering, war, and conflict, or are you only focusing on cultural destruction? Uh, in many respects, I'm focusing on on cultural destruction. I mean, I have made work about uh, September the 11th, 2001, mm -hmm. um, in a slightly detached way. I made uh, a series of drawings using rust from the 9-11 steel beams um, to portray interesting natural features in the landscape around the Bin Laden house in Pakistan. So it's several steps removed, but for me making those works was about completing the circle of experiencing uh, through the portal of news media 9-11. Uh, I was in upstate New York when it happened um, and bringing the material into the process so that I could um, close that experience in my, in my emotional self. Um, and those works portrayed potatoes being dug up in fields, the boundary in Laden House, um, ancient trees, which are on the edge of the field, banyan trees, which replant themselves into the ground from their branches. Uh, those works are sepia-toned brown ink, and that's the ink from 9-11. So it's very circular because steel and rust, rust is halfway between steel and soil. Soil provides nutrition that keeps the trees alive, produces the crops and the fields. So I've made work that in that respect, they, for me, are, are rather like meditations on 20 years after 9-11. Um, and those are, in many respects, acknowledgements for me of what happened on the day. And, and, and that was tremendous human loss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the next question, I'm also going to paraphrase a little bit. Uh, you, you talked about uh, uh, conditioning of, of thinking, cultural conditioning, what have you. Uh, what are ways do you think uh, that can prevent that type of conditioning, whether it's the teaching of philosophy or art in schools? How do you break free of that? Education. Absolutely. Education. And it's a particular type of education. It's not uh, the type of education where you're taught um, to answer questions in multiple choice examinations. It's a type of questioning uh, where, for example, I had a teacher, English teacher, who used to write across the blackboard at the end of every lesson, a question, and then the word discuss. And as he wrote discuss, everyone in the class would go, mm. <laughs> but he was absolutely right. What he was doing was he was saying, he'd write a question and by saying discuss, he was saying form an opinion, find out what you think, research it, figure out where you stand, and then tell us why. And if you're not able to do that, you can never be unbiased 
you can never look across the board and see the world through the eyes of somebody who you may not appreciate, may not know, you may not understand, you may not like, but there may be something to what they're saying. And if you're able to think about the world through different directions, through different prisms, you'll be able to make a truly informed decision. And the education that provides that is the key to stopping extremism from rising up out of the woodwork, in my personal opinion, I'm sure the people who are different. All right, well, well, we'll have time for one more question uh, and, then, and then we'll wrap. Um, and this is about your actually your current work. So can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about your current project in Berlin and yeah. how is this related to your previous work? Okay, well, um, great question. All good questions. This, this one I particularly like because my, my head is in this space at the moment. So um, a, a number of years ago, I did a little bit of a project with Pergamon. They gave me permission to mold the Battle of Berlin damage from the west face wall of the building. Um, at the time, I didn't understand this story. Uh, in early 1900s, a German man was traveling around modern day Syria before it was the nation state of Syria. And he found a very, very important ancient site. Um, and uh, when he found this place, the locals, he found it because the locals were smashing sculptures there. And he asked them through a translator, why, why are you doing this? And they said, well, they're devils. They're, they're evil. They're evil things. And we have to destroy them completely, get rid of them. And he said, well, where did they come from? And they showed him what was basically um, the archaeological site, beginnings of an archaeological site, which has become known as Tel Halaf, very, very important place. He said to, the, to these people, can I buy these things from you and take them away from here? And the original writings of the Prophet Muhammad, you can tax um, idolatry. And one way of taxing it is to make people pay for it. And then it's theirs and they remove it and it's no longer your problem. So the process of him buying them for them was acceptable because it was a tax. They were receiving money in exchange for him taking these things away. He took them to Berlin. A few of them ended up in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and the rest went into the Tel Halaf Museum in Berlin. Fast forward to 1945, the Allies are bombing Berlin, the building burns, fire department shows up, hoses down the building, all the tar from the roof has been on fire, melted in through the building, this big inferno. The cold water from the hoses hit the sculptures and they exploded into 22,000 pieces. I mean, the guy was devastated. He never really recovered from this. But the Pergamon Museum staff came and said, let us help you. And we are going to gather all these pieces up and we're going to keep them in boxes in the basement at Pergamon. And maybe one day there's a way to restore these sculptures. Fast forward again to present day, 11 years ago, an amazing lady called Nadia Chalidis, who works at the Pergamon, said, I'm going to undertake this restoration program. program. And everybody said, you're completely nuts. Three-dimensional sculptures, 22,000 pieces. Nine years later, she'd done it. So I went to the Pergamon. She allowed me to scrape that burning, that burnt tar off the pieces of these sculptures. And I have enough of it to make, grind it down and make an ink. And with that ink, I will make drawings which tell in a narrative fashion the story of the discovery of Tel Halaf, transport to Berlin, end of the museum, restoration. Wow, that sounds fascinating. Uh, Piers, thank take you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, this was a very wonderful welcome. presentation. Uh, I know I speak on behalf of the entire uh, audience. Uh, we, we will greatly appreciate uh, your insight. Uh, as a reminder, uh, for those of you who are still here, uh, the UNO uh, Nobody's Listening exhibition is still currently on display at the UNO Art Gallery. It runs until February 23rd. Again, Piers, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody uh, for tuning in. Ha have a good night. Thank you.